So in today's video, we're going to be installing a B2B battery to battery charger, DC to DC charger, um, whichever way you want to call it. Um, this is replacements for things like VSR split charge relays, which are really bad ideas these days. So um, yeah, the B2B, the DC to DC charger is definitely the way forward. Uh, in the past, I've fitted a Sterling in our old um, van, but in this one, I haven't got the option to actually kind of place it anywhere that I can keep an eye on it see what the charge rate is and things like that so I've gone from a Victron so I can connect to it via Bluetooth to see what's going on now a couple of things that I want to mention is um, breakers some of these are little circuit breakers that you can reset so rather than having an isolator and a fuse uh, basically this just kind of like does both if there's ever an issue in line it will trip um, or if you want to isolate the circuit and disconnect the power you can manually trip it. Uh, there are two variants. Obviously, technology is changing all the time. So this is another one. And this, believe it or not, they both do the same thing. Uh, and this one basically allows you to connect your device. And should it have a problem, there's a tiny little button on there that just manually trips it out. So there are two variants of this DC to DC charger. One is an isolated and one is non-isolated. The way you can really tell is they've both got positive and negative for the input and output. Whereas the non-isolated shares a common negative. Now that's great if your van uses its chassis to share all the negatives from the starter battery, so the vehicle battery, and your leisure battery, which is quite common, then basically you can use the non-isolated version. But in my van, because of the construction of the van, uh, there isn't a common chassis negative anywhere like that, because half of the chassis is actually fiberglass and aluminium. So that just doesn't work. Um, so basically I've gone for the isolated version so that I need to provide it with a negative and positive from the starter battery, as well as a negative and positive to my leisure batteries. So just to make that sort of uh, clear there, what's the difference between the isolated and non-isolated version? So like I say, if you are installing it in a metal chassis vehicle and your negative on your vehicle side of electrics um, is ground to the chassis, which is quite normal, um, and also you've ground the negative of your leisure batteries to the vehicle chassis, then you can get the non-isolated version and that'll work fine. But if you install it in a motorhome or you install it in a vehicle where you don't know if that shared negative is to the chassis or not, um, then it's best to get this version and that way then it'll work automatically. So a few points to go over here. Um, this is the second uh, B2B charger we've got in our van because the van's Burstner system, which is called an electro block, the electric system, has um, a combined B2B and uh, main hookup charger, which is 20 amps. So 20 amps really isn't a really big enough charge, uh, especially because we've got 216 amps of usable lithium battery. So this is a bit of a test on my behalf, actually. I wanted the Victron charger to be wired up in addition to the the Electroblock, the Burstner charger, uh, meaning I can get up to 50 amps of charge. Um, and it worked out fine. There's a lot of people out there that say you can't put like two solar controllers on the same line because one will detect the charge from the other one and shut it down. Um, and there's a lot of people that have said the same for BT to, uh, B2B chargers as well, that you can't have more than one uh, because if they're both connected to the same battery, then one would shut the other one down because it's detecting an incoming charge. So hopefully that has disproved that myth. So one thing to point out, and it is explained in the manual, that this gets very hot. Um, obviously a big heat sink on the back there. So don't mount it on anything that's going to melt, like plastic or anything like that. If you can mount it on a metal chassis, that would be great because it will allow the heat to dissipate. Or otherwise mount it in a well ventilated area. Um, I don't have any of them. I don't have plastic, I don't have metal, and I've not got a well ventilated area. Um, so what I've done is I've cut a hole in the cupboard that it's mounted on the back to. So there's basically a hole on the back there and I've mounted a grill on the other side, which allows the heat of that to dissipate out of the cupboard through the grill. Uh, and so far that's worked all right, but yes, it does get really hot. So just bear that in mind as well. This is fairly explanatory. The input is the positive and negative feed from your starter battery. 
so the actual vehicle's battery. And yes, you do need a positive and a negative feed from the battery itself. Your output, again, a negative feed to your negative side of your fuse box or your negative bus rail, and positive to either the positive side of your fuse box, or if you wanted to do it with a breaker, um, then you could use the breaker and have it from the positive side of the output through the breaker and then out from the breaker to your positive bus rail. Now the wiring setup is very easy. Connect it up to your starter battery first. And when the light comes on and the Bluetooth light is flashing, then pair to the device. The instructions about pairing are in this manual that you get with it. Once you've paired the device, you may need to update the firmware, all that's done automatically. Um, and you will need to tell it what type of batteries you're going to connect to before you connect the batteries. Now, if you wanted to, you could connect this up with a breaker and have it open circuit so it wasn't connected. But the way I did it was I connected it to the starter battery I left these two terminals out, set it all up, did the firmware update, told it I was connecting to lithium batteries and changed a couple of the settings in there so that the lithium batteries were set per my lithium battery manufacturer spec. So that is the top level of charge so that you know it's 100% charged, the float and the absorption rate, that kind of thing. And once you've done that, you then connect it up to your ledger batteries, like I say, via a circuit breaker, whichever one you want to choose. And then once it's connected and everything's up and running, you plug this into there. So what happens once you plug that in, it means the system will automatically detect when the engine's running and the alternator has reached a certain voltage, and then it will fire up the B2B charger and start charging your leisure batteries. So without that, that won't work. Um, alternatively, you can, if you wanted to, have that via a little switch so that you could control manually when this was on or off. But obviously what I want to do is I want to have it automatic so that whenever the engine is running, this will kick in and determine what charge is needed for my leisure batteries. So for this bit, I'm using 16 mil cable. So this cable is going to go from the battery and I'm just going to feed it under the floor through some little cutouts I've got through the floor. So the battery is just over there through the floor and into the battery box there. We're then going to put the DC to DC charger. I'm just trying to tape these up right now, tape the ends together so it makes it easier to feed through the floor. So that's the first bit done. Got it through that hole there, through there. What I need to do now is there's a little plate under here. So that's our carpet and then there's this little plate. So those three screws there need to um, remove that plate, which will give me access to a channel that runs under there, which will let me force the cable hopefully um, around the base of this seat um, and then I can get underneath there where the battery is and connect the cables up. So to put these lugs on the end these are 16 mil lugs with an M10 hole in there so you've got your cable you get your lug you trim back the sheath enough that the lug fits over and it's got to fit over all the wires worth giving it a bit of a twist and then put it on so the wires come to the end inside there this is the uh, hydraulic crimping tool. We're going to pass that through there. And the main aim then is to make sure that you're pushing down on the lug at all times while you're crimping the end. So that the cable is pushed in as much as possible. And then obviously the hydraulic bit is just that you apply as much pressure as you can there and your cable is crimped. And that's it. Give it a good pull. Make sure you can't pull it off. And that's it done. So those are my leads that have come from the other end. So the input of the B2B looped round and then that's the negative from the other side of the battery as well. So there is a breaker fuse at the other end of this cable before it goes into the B2B. But should this ever be pinched in such a way that there's bare wires there and it you know shorts out with the floor, the chassis, or maybe it shorts out with the other negative cable, uh, that fuse will blow, thus protecting the battery and everything else at this end. Obviously there's a battery cover going over here um, and then this carpet that goes over there as well. So uh, that's pretty much the installation at this end all finished off, all nice and uh, complete. So there you go, that's all finished off, all under the mat, all nice and hidden away. We know it's nice and safe now, so we can now go and work at the other end where the B2B is. Right, moment of truth now. Let's um, close the breaker. Lights are flashing. 
So all we need to do now is to connect to it. And of course, the first thing it wants to do is update the software. So let that done, and then we'll go through and set the parameters for the battery types. Basically, it's just a matter of setting the um, lithium LiPo 4, make sure all the details are correct, that kind of stuff. So hopefully that'll come out. Basically, I've set it up now so that we're using the preset that's in the software, um, and that's coming up as the LiPo 4. So uh, that's going to be all set up now. Um, I've put it onto charger mode as well. And um, yeah, pretty much ready to go. All I need to do now is to connect the output out to the batteries and we're good to go. So what the book actually says is once you have done this stage, whereby you've connected the battery and that's all up and running, you've logged onto it and updated it and everything else, and you've then connected it into your 12 volt battery system. What I've done is I've turned this into charger mode. I put it onto the lithium battery setting. And then it says once you've set it all up and it's all done, you insert this little plug into there and then i'm going to start the engine and see what the battery monitor says time to turn the key let's have a look what amps we get so that's 29 hopefully it should kick in, in a minute and we'll get the benefit of both There we go, so that's both 50 amps. There we go, spot on. So really happy with that one, 51, 51 and a bit. So there you go, still at bulk charge. Once we get to bulk charge, uh, we'll then be at absorption. And once we've done absorption, it's flow. And it's all detected internally. And it tells you at each stage it's at as well. The only downside then, it really just tells you the voltage that it's getting from the alternator and then the voltage it's uh, bumping up to to give to the leisure batteries. So like I say, it's converting a much lower voltage to a much higher voltage. So once it's installed, essentially you just leave it be, in all fairness. Um, when we need power, we simply start the engine. Uh, the original electro block one from burst, so that kicks in straight away. It's got no real sense of what's going on. It just starts to give me 20 amps charge straight away. And then usually within about 30 seconds, the Victron charger has detected a output of the alternator slightly picked up. So it's got a certain threshold of the volts it needs to see at the um, starter battery. And then that kicks in and starts to supply the second charge. So essentially I'm getting two charges. One's a nice big chunky one and one's a bit of a weedy one. Um, the problem with the Electroblock charger is it might be a 20 amp charger, um, but it quickly drops. It's not a very powerful charger. So in real terms, we were probably getting anywhere between eight and 12 amps out of it, which um, would have taken hours of the engine running to charge the batteries back up. Whereas the Victron is pretty much 30 amps pretty much to 95% battery charge and then it ever so slightly starts to back off um, as the absorption level reaches 100% on the battery and it gets obviously itself back to float level and fully charged. So yeah, it couldn't be simpler really. You like say from the app, you've got all the options in there to change all the battery settings. You can either choose preset profiles or you can set up everything manually, um, including how long you want it to stay on absorption for, uh, what the absorption voltage should be and all that kind of stuff. It's all set within the app, all very easy to do. Um, it just basically gives you the ability to put a charger into your system now. So for example, if you've got AGM or standard lead acid, and then in the future, say you do find a really good deal on some lithium batteries, um, you can just swap it out, log into the app, and then change the profile in there. So it's you know now changing lithium batteries. So I think that in itself is pretty good in the fact that you don't need to buy separate equipment, different equipment, or anything like that. It'll do everything just from everything that's built in it. Um, and like I say, can't argue with a five-year warranty either, really, can you? So um, all the Victron gear I've had over the last few years, I've never had any problems with it. Touch wood. Uh, and that's why I bought this. Uh, I just thought it was the best one. Uh, why didn't I go for the 50 amp version? Um, literally because of space in my cupboard. All right, thanks for watching today's little B2B installation and little guide video. If you've got any questions, obviously leave them in the comments section down below and I'll do my best to answer them. And take care everyone. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.